a session with the Vice President of Nigeria, Yemi Oshinbajo. We're going to start with an indication, sir, of where the Nigerian economy is right now, given the fact that we are striving for inclusive growth, and that's not just an African agenda, it's a global agenda. So let me hand it to you. Just give us a synopsis of where we are right now. Okay. Um, first time, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for uh, coming. I um, want to say first, I'm sure that most of us already know uh, the background to where we are in Nigeria, and um, why, why uh, where, where we are. I think the most important um, narrative today is what our plans are to get out of the recession. Uh, we have uh, a Nigeria Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, uh, which is a four-year medium-term plan, which uh, first addresses the question of getting us out of the recession, and then, of course, uh, how to go on the path of sustainable growth. The most important aspects of that plan are you know, macroeconomic stability, diversification of our economy, and a, a very uh, robust social investment scheme. Now, they, they just, just to go from the social investment scheme, because that uh, speaks to the question of inclusion. The social investment scheme is peculiar in the sense that it's not a, so it's not a social safety net uh, in the traditional way. This is one where we are actually uh, looking to develop capacity, especially in the young people. So a lot of the investment actually goes into the development of capacity at the level of very, very young people. So we have a, a, a scheme which is called Empire, a 500,000 uh, young graduates are being engaged, they're being employed, it's a volunteer core program. But well, they have been engaged to be teachers in primary schools, to be public health officials, as well as um, uh, as well as uh, extension uh, workers for the farms. But more importantly, is the training that goes with that. Each of them will be trained. Each of them will be armed with a device, which enables them to be trained in a wide variety of, of areas, especially technology training, even writing codes, you know, and uh, uh, training you know, on an ongoing basis and improving their capacity. Mr. Vice President, yes. key to that social development plan will yes. be macroeconomic stability, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and also diversification of the economy. Let's talk a bit about the macroeconomic stability, because yes. at the moment investors are a little concerned. They're excited, though, because the opportunity of 180 million plus consumers in Nigeria is incredibly appealing to anybody wanting to make money in a low growth environment. Yes. So where can you assure investors that this economic growth and recovery plan is going to lead to macroeconomic stability? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that um, most investors in Nigeria, most who see the investment coming in Nigeria, are actually uh, quite bullish. And I, and I believe that many of them see what the immediate prospects are. If you look at the macroeconomic environment, and, and one of the reasons why in our earlier discussion this morning, I was pointing out that once you understand why you are where you are, and for investors, they're smart. They understand it. I mean, it's not a structural problem, as someone pointed out. For instance, look at foreign exchange availability. It's a supply issue. We know why we don't have foreign, as much foreign exchange as we ought to have. And a lot of that has to do with the problems of oil production, which was of course affected by the insurgency in the Niger Delta and, and all of that. We're resolving that. Once that is resolved, obviously more dollars come into the, in, into the, in, into the market. When we have more dollars, those who are looking to import are able to import even more. Now, in, uh, but just going beyond that, also affecting uh, the, the policy, our foreign exchange policy which we have, and carrying that uh, uh, policy to its logical conclusion, ensuring that it enables support Again, again, just as I said, it's a supply issue. And the only way to deal with the supply issue is to supply the dollars. I mean, there's no other way to, to 
again controlling what the dollar does. And the dollar will come from uh, our export, from our oil export, which is 94% of foreign exchange income, as well as a robust foreign exchange market. And that's why I'm saying implementing uh, foreign exchange policy, which would allow more which would allow more dollars to come into the economy. The only way that people will be export, uh, also bring in the dollars, is, uh, the dollars will be able to go out, is that market, is ensuring that the market is available. That market is the dollar market, which has uh, the foreign exchange market. And those are the issues that we're addressing. Yes, and, and one of the reasons why we're very confident in this market, <coughs> see, there, 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 there are two issues. If you look at what, if you look at the average uh, investor in Nigeria, I mean, investors in oil and gas are very few. So they make their own wealth. I mean, there are large investors in oil and gas. There are, there are investors who look at cement, which is a big you know, opportunity, which is a, uh, a big uh, industrial activity in Nigeria. They also make dollars from exports and all of that. Now, there are those who are manufacturing, but they are importing 85% and over. Now, that's a slightly more difficult problem. You know, and where you have that kind of large importation, you obviously are going to have problems unless you invest locally. And that's why we're also trying to direct attention to, to local investment. People simply have to invest locally. We're investing 50 billion in export processing zones this year alone. Those export processing zones are supposed to create an opportunity for, for investors to invest locally and draw from local resources. So this is an opportunity for the investor. I mean, we're not going to, we're not going, I mean, it's okay if the I, investors. <laughs> I don't want to dwell on foreign yeah. exchange, but there's just one other statement that yeah. you made recently, and that is yeah. that we need to see the gap closing between the official and the parallel market, which that gap sitting at about 60% at the mm -hmm. moment. When is that going to happen? Can you give a timing? Well, it's difficult to give a timing about currency movements and all of that, as you probably imagine. Uh, what it is really is what is the policy that's going to lead to that? We already have a foreign exchange. We already have a foreign exchange policy. Now, that policy, and that's the point I've been making all along, that stabilizing that policy, ensuring that that policy works, in, uh, that that policy works fully, is really what we're trying to get uh, in our interactions before with the central bank, which of course is independent is we're trying to get them to see that you need to implement this policy fully. Central Bank, of course, has its own constraints. They're saying, hey, look, we have to be careful, but we simply can't allow the currency to float. We have to look at all of the market conditions and all of that. But, re but really, the point we're making is that we must create the environment which will help uh, the, the, the central bank as well. That will come from an increasing supply of dollars from oil exportation. Once we have more dollars, Central bank obviously has more confidence in floating the currency. So, so a lot of these is, you know. Take your point. Let's come yeah. back to that oil production. You need to average over 2 million barrels a day to mm. basically make your production targets for the year. Yes. With the situation resolved, are you going to be able to meet those production targets? Because this is the money that you're talking about. Yeah. You're yeah. not going to have to revise uh, the numbers downwards. Mm. Has anything mm. fundamentally changed in mm. the production Cycle. Yes, I, I think we'll be able to do uh, possibly even over 2.2 uh, million barrels a day. As you we were able to resolve all of these problems, and we expect that we will be able to resolve the problems. What has also happened, of course, is that uh, we used to have uh, cash call difficulties. I mean, in the past, uh, the, with, our, with our joint venture partners, there were issues of uh, government paying uh, its own portion of, of the cash calls. Now that has been resolved with the major IOCs. We now have a self-financing um, uh, regime, which allows for cost recovery, so that we, do, we are not going to have to be putting forward all of this uh, cash calls. We're also paying the backlog in debts and all of that of about 5.1 billion. And we're doing that by uh, increasing production. What the IOCs are meant to do is to increase their production in order to pay for that backlog. So we think that we have a regime now, we have a financing arrangement that allows the market, you know, that, that allows all production, allows so more investment. So you will hit the average, the 2.2 uh, yeah, yeah, million yeah, barrels yeah. a day. We're reasonably confident that we will, yes. Let's talk about the turnaround plan for the power sector specifically. Yes. The World Bank has given you their commitment. They met with the federal government mm -hmm. end of last year. They've given you your, their, their commitment to work together to create mm -hmm. a turnaround. 
again, can you give me a little visibility on the steps that are going to be made in the power sector specifically because privatization of the Nigerian power sector has been underway for three years and now obviously it's stalled mm. given the environment. Maybe a bit longer than three years actually. But uh, the, 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 uh, two issues. One is the very great uh, thing that the World Bank is working with us. And in particular, the World Bank is working on, the, on actually the market, which really is a problem. You know, the, the market and the liquidity in the market is really where, we, where, where the challenges are, aside from you know, the other issues. But I think that the main issue is creating a market that is self-sustaining. And I think that's where the World Bank comes in. Because you have a situation where, okay, you are producing this much power, but it must be sold and it must be paid for. Those who are selling, or those who are buying must pay for it. You must pay for gas. Now, ensuring that that market is resourced, ensuring that that liquidity is there, is really where, this, where the uh, World Bank comes in and where we're working with the World Bank. So if, we, if we're able to resolve the liquidity issues, which is important, of course, the other problems are problems of generation, transmission, especially transmission. Transmission was about 5,000 uh, megahertz capacity, and that's the, for the grid. Uh, and we've now moved that up, we've increased that in terms of uh, its simulation to about 6,500 megahertz and up to even 7,200 megahertz at the end of last year in terms of just the, trans, uh, of the capacity uh, to, for, for transmission, which is very crucial. But I think the most important thing is how some of the, don't forget that this is a privatized environment, at least generation and uh, distribution are privatized. But when you privatize, of course you expect that there will be further investments by uh, the, the private sector players. A lot of the private sector players, especially the distribution companies, are highly leveraged. So there's a need for them, of course, to find fresh capital to be able to invest, invest in metering, for example, just metering, so that they can collect their, 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 their money and all of that. They can collect uh, their uh, tariff invoices and all that. We're, we're, that that's, that's an area where we need to do a lot of, uh, where, where, where we need to do a lot of work, trying to get money into into the system, and we believe the World Bank partnership is going to help a great deal in that respect. At the beginning of our conversation, you spoke about the importance of macroeconomic stability, diversification, and social inclusion. Mm -hmm. So let's touch on this diversification, because we've spent a lot of time on the power of the oil and gas environment. Agriculture is enormous for Nigeria, and potentially Nigeria can become the breadbasket of Africa. Where are we on that plan? Or if you prefer to choose a, a different sector that you more di diversified into, I'm, I'm open to that discussion. Yeah, agriculture is crucial. And um, we're paying a great deal of attention to agriculture. As a matter of fact, agriculture is possibly uh, the second largest contributor to our GDP. So it's, it's, it's big for us. Now, what, we plan, what we're planning to do in agriculture and what we're doing in agriculture is First, we intend to be uh, completely uh, uh, self-sufficient in rice production, in tomato, in wheat. And uh, in rice, just take rice, for example. Rice is an important commodity for us. There's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of demand for rice. But more importantly, there's also a lot of foreign exchange being spent on rice importation. Exactly. You, yes. you import yes. a great deal well, of rice. Yeah. But now, but now, with the work that we're doing in, in, in growing rice, especially in KB State, in Sokoto State, Jigawa State, in the northern uh, rice belt, as well as uh, in Eboi State in, in the southeast, that we're seeing that there's a great deal more activity in that sector. For example, a KB State, which is in the north, and Lagos State just came together to do, uh, uh, just over Christmas, KB State produces large amounts of rice and they supplied Lagos State with the rice, and they were able to work together to produce uh, several thousand bags of rice, which was sold over the Christmas on an experimental basis. And we actually saw price of rice dropping in the markets. So those kinds of collaborations are important, but, more, more, but the more important narrative is that we're producing the rice aggressively, and that we're able to produce you know, larger acreage of rice because we have the right seedlings, we have, we're, we're irrigating and we're financing that sector. There's a, what is called the Anchor Borrowers Program and we're financing rice. So rice is big. Also tomatoes. We've got about yeah. a minute left. So yeah. 
beyond agriculture, you've got oil and gas. Manufacturing. Manufacturing. Yes, yes. Obviously, cement production yes. um, from the Dangote Industries. Yes. Just a final question. Let's come back to the economic turnaround plan. Yes. Is it documented? Can people go in, survey it, and basically look at the timelines that you've put in place? Yes. We, we will formally launch the four-year uh, economic recovery and growth plan uh, in uh, mid-February. We've already written it out, our, and uh, many parts of it were discussing, the outlines of it were discussing, but it will be formally launched as a document uh, in the middle of February. But our current 2017 budget is actually based on, on the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. By the way, the, we had a strategic implementation plan, which we started with in 2016. And the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan is actually a development of that strategic implementation plan. So if you look at the strategic implementation plan, you're able to see the general direction in which we're going. But the full document is to be launched uh, in February of uh, this year, which is next month. And Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for joining me for this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, Yemi Osinbajo, the Vice President of Nigeria. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.